Milan, Ohio. Population 1,300. A small, all-American town. To locals, Milan, Ohio is known for its darker past. A shock. Just couldn't believe it. On April 1st, 1968, a triple murder rocked this small farm town. An entire family slain in one night. No one was ever charged, no one was ever arrested in the case. The case still ice cold, and still there are few clues. The hope to ever solve it, it gets dimmer as the years go by. Yeah, somebody wanted to kill him for some reason, which the motive to this day remains unknown. The story goes like this. The home sits off State Route 13. It is rural and it is quiet. 41-year-old William and 37-year-old Ann Cassidy were asleep in their bed when a killer shot them point blank with a shotgun. Their 12-year-old daughter Patricia slept in the room next door, found viciously beaten, possibly with that same shotgun. She died in the hospital just days later. Nobody would deserve this, but especially a 12-year-old girl. The carnage discovered by the couple's son, Michael. He was 17 senior in high school. Michael had come home from work around four in the morning and found his family. He ran to his girlfriend's house and called the sheriff. Soon, the spotlight shifted to him. Um, he was cooperative through his attorney. As a matter of fact, um, he was uh, allowed to take a polygraph by his attorney and he passed the polygraph. Police say Michael was never charged, never arrested. I think we know who had done, who had done it, but uh, nothing had better ever been proved. What do you think of it? The son, Mike. That is Bob Rear's theory. He knew the family well, worked on their cars in his auto shop. Rear is 80 years old now, still living down the street from the Cassidy family home. This case, it still haunts him. They weren't no troublemakers or nothing. Everybody around here liked him. With nothing to pin the murders to Mike, police moved on to another theory. They thought it possible that the killer was a drifter. One of the theories was that um, someone or person or persons had come off of the railroad or come off of the turnpike and had done this. Um, that was never really ruled out. Nothing was missing from the home. This wasn't a robbery gone wrong. It was murder is what it was. That shotgun never found. Only a single shell casing left behind. But investigators did come across a mystifying piece of evidence. A book left on the living room coffee table. In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. The chilling nonfiction book details the gruesome quadruple murder of a family living in rural Kansas. There is no perfect crime. I think that um, some people may get away with a crime, but I don't think there is a perfect crime. The Cassidy family is buried together, side by side by side. Patricia, Anne, William. Three lives taken in one unspeakably dark and violent night. Their killer walking free. And police believe someone in this town knows. William, Anne, Patricia. They lay waiting for that someone to speak up. If we ever get that phone call, that we could move forward and solve this. Waiting for that someone to shine a light. All right, folks, we have a number, the Erie County Sheriff's Office, 419-627-7668, 419-627-7668. If you have any information, you know, maybe you lived in that area and moved away and, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, they never solved that? Maybe I have some information. That's the number to call. It's been a long time, but no case is too old to be solved. Joining us now, the Erie County Sheriff's, uh, from the Sheriff's Office in Ohio, the Sheriff, Paul Sigsworth, is with us. Uh, Sheriff, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having us, Vinny. We appreciate the opportunity. Let's go back to 1968. And we know the world of uh, crime scene processing and, and what we can do is much different. Um, how different, though, were, were crime scenes processed back in 1968 in terms of gathering the evidence? And how would you evaluate uh, the way it was done? Well, things are done now tremendously differently than what was done in 1968. Um, what was done then, they did call for state crime scene agents to respond to the house. I believe they got there two days later. Um, again, everybody did the best that they could, I believe, at the time. Obviously, times have changed. Techniques have changed. 
we would have crime scene investigators now at that scene almost immediately to assist us in processing uh, the evidence processing the scene. And that just didn't happen then um, because of the limitations that were present in that time. And the, and the one thing a lot of folks always point to is, is the possibility of DNA evidence that may have been left behind. Um, and the way the scene was processed, is that a possibility here? Um, it could be, um, but we do not have any DNA evidence at this time. All right, let me ask you about the Cassidy family. Was there anything going on uh, in the lives of the Cassidy family? I mean, they're living in this very rural town. They look like a, a regular family, but w w was there anything going on there? No, I mean, it, they were a regular family. Um, the people in the community at that time were, sh I would term it, shocked and stunned by the fact that, you know, these individuals were murdered apparently in their sleep at night uh, in their home. There was really nothing compelling that would indicate that there was any type of problem between the family and other people in the community. And that was really, I think, what the shock was. Um, from what I see in the records, the family was pretty well thought of. Um, I believe dad was a salesman. Uh, mom, you know, at that time was, uh, stayed at home, was considered a housewife. Uh, the daughter went to school. Everything was normal. The son was in school. And so there wasn't a lot of, if you will, concern that, oh, something like this, you know, we thought would happen to them. It's nothing like that. We've, we've posted the story. Um online as well and, and want folks to go on, on, on Facebook and other places to share it, uh, to spread the word out uh, again. Uh, but they, folks are also posting some comments and I wanted to uh, ask you about a couple of them, Sheriff. Uh, Teresa writes, just wonder what sort of polygraph they had in 1968. I realize neither are reliable 100% or they'd be able to be used in court. Just wondering if the ones we have now are more reliable. I believe if the brother did not do it, he knows who, who did it, is what Teresa is saying. So have, have polygraphs changed at all, or the analysis of those results? Well, I'm not a polygraph expert, but I believe they have changed. Um, the techniques that they use to um, do the, the testing. So you have to talk to a polygraph expert about that. Gotcha. But, um, you know, polygraph is used by us uh, routinely um, in investigations that we do either polygraph or what's referred to as a CVSA. Now, the, the brother, uh, Michael, do we know, if, is he still around? Is he still in town? Um, ha has, have you spoken to him in, in any recent times? He has been spoken to in recent times, yes. He does not live here locally anymore. He lives out of state. And is, did, did he have any information about anything that, that he saw or anyone? that Because he, he, he was, I guess the story is he was coming home from work that night. Do we know? where he was working till four in the morning as a 17 year old? Yeah, he worked at a bar actually in the nearby city of Huron and his job was to clean the bar after it closed. And his, um, his statement to the investigators was that he had left the bar and he had arrived home at about 4 a.m. And he had found um, his family um, in, in basically murdered. Uh, and so, uh, he went to an ex-girlfriend's house and reported his uh, observations to the police chief in the village of Milan. And then the sheriff's office was notified and the investigation went from there. And again, different times, right? We don't have cell phones, but there is a phone in the house. But he left the house and, and as a 17-year-old, I don't know how you react to that situation. It, it's, it's, it's horrific. Um, Shannon tonight is saying or asking, who did the book In Cold Blood belong to? And to me, that was the thing that really stuck out about all of this, because in, this is seemingly so similar to In Cold Blood. Um, was that ever determined where that book came from? Right. The investigators determined that um, it belonged to, I believe, the mother and that she was reading it. It was obviously a very popular book at the time. I do know that the investigators even viewed a special uh, preview of the movie In Cold Blood uh, just to see if they could relate anything in their investigation to the movie. Um, but I believe they reached a dead end with that as well. 
Well, Sheriff, we appreciate your time tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and giving us a little more insight into this one. And we'll stay on it. We're sharing it. And if you hear anything, um, we'd love to have you, you back on the program. And I appreciate the opportunity. We hope that someone out there will call us, has knowledge of this, so that we can gain closure for the family and the community as well. Absolutely. A small town like that uh, needs the closure as much as, as the family does. Thank you so much, Sheriff. Appreciate it. Thanks, Vinny. Appreciate it. All right, folks, when we come back, um, we're going to take a look at what's happening in Minneapolis. Some of the jurors and potential jurors talking about a lot of issues related to law enforcement. So we'll uh, go through it with our law enforcement experts in crime time. That is next.